what do you see as the most important or driving issue in this campaign? Well, that's a very good question. The most important issue is the fact that we have a Congresswoman who has enriched herself from her position in Congress. And I think that is extremely disturbing. And I mean, uh, Donna Shalala, um, let me backtrack. There is a law that says that if you are a member of Congress, you need to report every transaction that you do in the stock market within 45 days. And Ms. Shalala did not do that for a year. And she was caught. And I think that is corruption at its best. That's, that's corruption. And we cannot have corrupt politicians serving district number 27. So I would say that corruption is the most important issue facing us at this hour because of who she is representing district number 27. Okay, so let's uh, so let's delve into that a little bit. Let's talk about that because I, I saw that was uh, one of your, I think it may have even been your very first commercial was you hit this point, as you said, as you just repeated. Uh, in your commercial, you say she broke the law to enrich herself off coronavirus. So how did she enrich herself? She enriched herself because as I told you, there is a law in Congress that says that since you have privileged information, because you're sitting in Congress, you have info that neither you nor I have or any other regular citizen. So when you sit in Congress, you see things that give you information so you can go to the stock market and you can buy and sell in a better fashion. And that's exactly what she did. The law says that you have to do it every 45 days. You need to report what you're buying and what you're selling. And she didn't do that. What happened was, is that she enriched herself in $2 million and in, 30, in 365 days, she did not report those transactions to the ethics committee. But you said specifically, but, but I just want to be clear, because you said specifically, um, she enriched herself off the coronavirus. What, 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 how does, how does, what do you mean by she enriched herself off the coronavirus, though? Because some of the companies that she holds stock in are, and, um, are poised or could be in the list to receive money from the bailout, um, the, from the bailout funds that the federal government has created in that oversight committee that she is one of the members. So she is, she has the, the opportunity and she had the opportunity to enrich herself. But besides that, before that, for $2, $2 million that she was able to make by having privileged information and not reporting it as the law indicates. But but just to be clear again, because I, I want I think the facts are important here. What she, so what she said she did, and I don't think the facts dispute this, is that when she was elected to Congress, she held stocks in a number of companies, as you said. She claims that to avoid the very conflict of interest you're now accusing her of, she divested herself of the stock. The, the violation that, she, that, that you correctly state is that when you sell stock under the Stock Act, you have to report that you've sold stock. So, but again, all of these stock transactions took place in 2019, long before the coronavirus. So when you say that she enriched herself off the coronavirus, that's where I'm confused. I don't understand how she enriched herself off the coronavirus when she sold her stock in 2019. Because some of the stocks that she did not sell and she still has in her portfolio, and going back to what you were saying, I'll get back to that point now, going to that, she started selling, according to what her attorney said, she started selling stock because she was going to create a blind trust. Usually you create blind trust and then you start selling. She did it the other way around, according to what she was saying. So she started selling and buying I repeat, she made two hundred million dollars. She was buying. Net. Oh wait, wait. A she was. Uh, my understanding is she was just selling. She wasn't buying stock. She was selling and buying stock. And if you review the, uh, you review the documents from the ethics committee, you will see it. And I've just told you, she net profited two million dollars. Well, she so, net profited by selling the stock that she had previously owned before getting into Congress. I, I I'm not whether she owned them before or after, what we need to be 
understanding and what I think we need to be uh, concentrating on is the fact is that she broke the law. The law says that you have to report every 45 days what you do in the stock market. We're talking about more than 500 transactions. So she did not have much time to come to the district and pay attention to the constituents. Because when you're selling and buying in less than a year, 500 transactions, that takes a lot of, that takes a long time. So she should have been, I believe, investing that time and that energy into serving the, the constituents of district number 27. Okay, uh, uh, let's, so you think that, that Donna Shalala's corruption is the primary focus of this campaign? And I think that's one, and the other one is jobs and the economy. Jobs and the economy, because after the pandemic, Jim, we need to get back on our feet, economically speaking, and that's why I am proud to say, and I'm going to announce it here on your show, um, I've said it before, but I just want to repeat it now, is that I'm going to be, make or create out of my congressional office, if I'm elected to Congress, an employment center. I'm going to open on the weekends. I'm going to open evenings. I'm going to give the opportunity to everybody that lives in district number 27, have a better job. How am I going to do that? Because you know that there are, there are many, many hundreds of federal programs that give you the opportunity to learn something different, to have a better job. They pay your, employ your employer to hire you. And if you are a business owner and you want to make the federal government uh, your client, that's what we're there for. So that's why I want to open my doors and help everybody that lives in 27 have a better job if they want to. Learn how to do something differently if they want to. Are aren't, there, aren't, there, aren't there agencies that already do that? Career source among them? I mean, there are agencies that do the very thing. Why would you want to repeat and create an extra layer in your district when, not, when you could be sending those people and providing a, an avenue for those people to get that help? I, I guess I'm confused. So you're going to turn your entire congressional office into a jobs f center, a job well, fair? I never said the entire congressional office, but I'll say that I will dedicate an important part of the budget that is provided by the federal government. I will dedicate that to enhance those agencies to give information, to guide those people that do not know how to get to those agencies, where to go. Because you have a lot of people that just got to the United States and maybe even if there are people that have been here for a long period of time, they do not know what the system or how the system works. And I want to provide them with that opportunity. There are hundreds of programs, federal programs that people they don't even know about. And if you are at the federal level, then I think that you should be you should be providing that information because that information is power. And after the coronavirus, I mean, in which better way you can help people to achieve the American dream or to uh, uh, obtain equal justice or equal opportunity than helping them grow economically? That's, 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 my, that's my definition of the American dream, being able to make it economically. The president is currently and the administration is currently in court seeking to eradicate, dismantle, do away with Obamacare. Do you support the efforts by the president to do away with uh, the Affordable Care Act? I think that is a fantastic question. Look, if you like your Obamacare, you keep your Obamacare. There's no way that we can repeal the Obamacare if we do not offer something better or equal. All right, that's number one. But at the same time, we need more competition in the healthcare industry. Competition, because competition brings down prices. We need to offer better plans to those people that are in Obamacare, and if they want to stay there, they can stay there, but they should have an option. Perfect example is eye laser. Eye laser. It's not that regulated, and right now the prices are on the floor. And at what time? If you, wanted to up, if you wanted to do eye laser in your eyes, it was $20,000. Right now it's eight hundred. dollars Why? Because there is competition. That's what I would like to have. Something but, that I, is I guess, But I guess, I guess I don't understand. When you say if you like your Obamacare, you can keep your Obamacare. I don't know. So you oppose what the president is doing in trying to, because he's asking the, the Supreme Court to strike down Obamacare. What I believe is that the Supreme Court, we need to, will have to make that decision. But what I'm saying that as a member of Congress, to protect my constituents, 
we need, I need to tell you that if, if Obamacare needs to stay the way it is, unless we can provide for a better plan, a cheaper plan for more people. So along the, along the way, you keep Obamacare, and then my plan, the plan that I would like to see, is more competition within the healthcare industry. See, now, is, is, uh, I've seen you say before, and it seems like a different position you're taking now. You had previously opposed Obamacare. You had talked about, I want to keep the, keep, you know, the pre-existing conditions. I want to keep the part where it says that people can stay on their family, you know, on their parents' plan until they're 26. But I didn't hear you say that you're good with all of Obamacare. You don't, you don't have a problem. You, you, so you've never said that you wanted to do away with Obamacare. But I never told you, <laughs> you know, I am answering as a congressional candidate right now in our first interview, your question. What I'm saying to you is that the way things are now, we need to keep Obamacare and we need to keep the pre-existing conditions and we need to keep the kids until they're 26 but we need to introduce competition in a highly regulated and highly subsidized industry. Competition is what brings prices down. That's well, my position. Well, that seems to be Don Shalala's position is that, is that you keep Obamacare and you build on it. So where do you, where do you believe you differ from, uh, from Donna Shalala on this issue? It seems if you're breaking from the Republican party on this issue. Well, listen, it's not a matter of breaking or not. Donna could be saying many things, but then she does others. For instance, Donna was at one point this, the, the um, Secretary of Health, and right after that, she went to work for the United Health. She was part of her board of directors. So she is in both sides of the issue, according to what is convenient to her. Because I don't believe that you could be a public servant and serve for eight years as the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and the next day turn around and go to work for one of the most important private insurance companies in the country. That may be legal, but it's not ethical. Okay, so so you want to keep Obamacare, you want to make it better, so you disagree with the president and the administration going after it in, in the Supreme Court? Listen, I, can, I only have one vote, and I'm telling you the way I would vote and what I think it's good for district number 27. We have a lot of people in this district that need help when it comes to their health insurance. We gotta give that help. Right but now, just, the best help that we have is Obamacare. So we cannot be, take it away. If but just they don't have clear, something, get them. Just to be clear, previously you had opposed Obamacare, correct? No, I, I did not. I don't know where you got that from, Jim. Okay. But it's okay. It's all right. No. No, I, that's, that, so I, I want to talk about, I, was, I, I thought we were going to have more of a uh, disagreement on, on health care, but sounds like you're, you're right along that line that you want to keep Obamacare and you just want to add competition. It is what it is. It is what it is. You cannot take from people the only thing that many thousands of people have. You cannot take it away. I don't think that's Christian or that's, that's good. I mean, I'm not saying that Obamacare is perfect. It's not because many people thought that Obamacare was going to be maybe cheaper, was gonna have better services, but it is what it is. At this hour, we just need to, as I told you, competition is what we need to insert or what we need to bring to the health care industry in this country, competition. In the meantime, you keep what you have. All right, um, the president has been calling for a elimination of the payroll tax. Do you support eliminating the payroll tax? I think that we should we should um, uh, we should help our seniors. I, I need to re we don't need to review once I get to Congress. What does that how that how does that work? If that is temporary, if that's going to be permanent, I need to have more information that I don't have at this hour. But right, I think that we need to protect our seniors. Because you correctly identify that right? Because obviously, if you eliminate the payroll tax, that's the money that funds Social Security. Correct, and that's why I'm saying the seniors are first. But maybe that is a temporary measure that it will be until the end of the year and then we'll see how we can recoup that amount so what i'm saying to you is that we need to we have a very important large senior community in district number 27 and we got to preserve them and if i want to represent them in congress i need to do what's good for them all right let's talk about the coronavirus do you all right so because obviously major important issue the the president said recently that that he would give himself an a for his handling of the coronavirus do you agree 
I know exactly what coronavirus is all about because my 85 year old mother got the virus and she is very sick. So I know exactly what you're talking to me about. Um, I believe that, um, that what happened, that hindsight is 2020, that what happened to this country and to all over the world, elected officials just didn't have a manual that taught them what to do at the moment. I'm sure that some things should have been done differently. I'm not a scientist, um, but I believe that we should look at now. And right now we have a new opportunity and uh, the vaccine, according to the elected officials, is around the corner. That is going to change the whole scenario. I think the kids are gonna go back to school, hopefully next month. And they have been kept safe all throughout um, this, the school year that started in August. Our seniors are in the nursing homes. So there are some positive things happening. But I believe that what we have to talk about, Jim, is starting from now on, and that is jobs. Because if you did not get sick like my mom did, and you did not die, now you don't want to get sick. Your pocket cannot get sick. And that's why I want to be a very important force in district number 27 to help all those people that lost their job, that worked in restaurants, uh, people that need to make more hours or learn how to do something different because their store was closed down. That's where I come in. All right. So, so let's walk through this again because I, I want to I wanna get a better understanding. Okay. I don't have a job. All right. I walk into your congressional office. What are you going to do? I am going to ask you for your name and yeah. for your address <laughs> and probably your social security and your phone number. And I'm going to hook you up and connect you with hundreds of different programs that I'm going to have knowledge of because I'm going to be at the federal level that could help you. And then there are other programs that, that are specifically catered for small business. The federal government needs to spend $175 billion a year, 23% of what they spent on procurement on minorities, on women, on black and veterans. So we need to tap into that money and help those small business, three, four, five employees that could be doing cleaning services, computer services, attorneys, receptionists, uh, mechanics, all types of trades. And those people can be hooked up and become clients of the federal government, the best clients in the world. So That's I, again, what but I, again I, I, I go back to, I walk in your office, yes. you're going to hand me a list of programs that I can then go to, to try to get, find a job. So you're not actually going to find me a job. I'm not going to hand you. No, no, no. I'm going to walk you through it. And I'm going to put, I, I don't know yet specifically how many of my staff will be dedicated to that endeavor. But I tell you that I'm going to allocate a lot of funds so I can help you, Jim Defeaty, that do not have a job. And let's say you were a bartender. Let's say you were a bartender. Now you want to learn how to be a mechanic, right? So I'm going to walk you through the whole process by the hand. And I'm going to, at the end, make sure that you will be able to be retrained and that you will wind up with the job. Maybe not what you want, but you're going to have it. Now you're unemployed. So I'm going to make sure that you get a job by the end of the process. It could be, I don't know, three months, four months, but I will walk you. I will walk you by the hand. Make sure, because that is why I'm there for, which is the difference with my opponent. I don't want the title. I want the job. You want to go there and work for people, not just be and feel happy that you're the congresswoman. You you're said some, you, heavy, heavy lifting. You, you said something a, a second ago where you said, I don't know how many staff I'll have, you know, and the thing. As I understand congressional offices, you have to worry about folks who are going to be calling your office because they haven't gotten their social security check, their VA benefits. They have litany of problems. So, so what, what, what issues yeah, are you going to take away? away but wait a second. While, you're re, while you've got, your, got a, a large portion of your staff now in some sort of job service fair mode, Listen, what happens to the rest of it? The, you are, you're not being, you're, you're not seeing it. And I know that, that, that you want to see it because I know you like the idea. There are enough resources. The, the federal government gives you between 1.3, 1.5, don't quote me on this, but it gives you a budget that you can divide 
And I will, and this is something that I want you to pay attention to what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to donate my salary. I'm not going to make one penny off being a congresswoman. I'm going to donate my salary, which is few, uh, which is a uh, hundred and some thousand dollars. And I'm going to put it back into that to cover those holes that you're telling me about, because I'm there to serve. I'm not there to serve myself. So since I want to, I want to expand my staff to take care of what you just said about the social security and the veterans and all those regular administrative issues that you got to deal with. But at the same time, I want to invest um, next year, if I'm elected, resources to help those people that need to get back on their feet, economically speaking. I, I want to go back to the coronavirus. For, I, I want to go back to the coronavirus for a second. Right. You were, you've been a proponent of hydroxychloroquine. Is that correct? Well, you know, I'm not a scientist. I heard from uh, people that I work with very closely that from a doctor, my doctor told me that it was pretty good way back when at the beginning, March, April, May. But you, but you endorsed it, but you endorse it. You have a TV program, you know, what your, your TV program is sponsored by Cano Health. Is that correct? Yeah, they, they are. Yes, they have. And uh, they, they're one of the main sponsors and Dr. Uh, Marlo, uh, Hernandez Cano came on the show and he was a strong advocate of that medicine. So I couldn't question it. I'm not a doctor. But you also directed people go to uh, Cano Health and this is where you can get your hydroxychloroquine. I didn't say it just like that. I said, my mom belongs to Cano Health. <laughs> and Cano, the principal of Cano Health, a doctor, medical doctor, was saying that that uh, chloroquine was good at the time. So I don't want you to put words in my mouth. I don't know where you're going, but I'm not a scientist. I cannot tell you whether it's good or bad. Just like when the, the doctor tells you, hey, you have a sore throat, you gotta take antibiotics. So I go, okay, well, I'm gonna take antibiotics. Well, it's, but my point is, I guess I, I you know, earlier you accused Donna Shalala of, of profiting off of the coronavirus and the primary sponsor of your television show, which pays your salary, I'm assuming, is pushing hydroxychloroquine, and you're pushing hydroxychloroquine. You know, does that not represent That's a conflict? Him. You cannot compare. You cannot compare the fact that Congresswoman, that Donna Shalala profited during one whole year by selling more than 500 stocks and making $2 million net off her job as a congresswoman because she had privileged information and on top of that she didn't well, even what, follow wait a second, wait a second. you you said that you said that before what privileged what privileged information did she use to sell stocks for i mean i, I guess you're making a serious allegation so as a journalist you should understand what privileged information did she have that led her to sell specific stocks because there's no complaint about that okay and this is very simple. I'm going to tell you as a, as a former journalist, the Stock Act says very clearly that members of Congress have privileged information that they acquire by just sitting in Congress. For that reason, the Stock Act law or the Stock Law um, tells everybody that sits in Congress that they have to file every fi 45 days every single stock transaction, if they have time to do that, because they should be very busy working for the constituents. Every 45 days, they need to report every single stock that they sold or they bought. Right, and she Period. failed to do that, which is an absolute violation, and she's, she's made up for it since, but there's no, but I have not seen anyone make a connection that says that she received a piece of information in Congress, sold specific stocks because she had insider information. There's been no allegation of insider trading on Donna Shalala. Because the press is with Donna Shalala. That's, That's why. why. Well, do you, you have proof of insider you know trading? Listen, if the law is telling you that you need to report every 45 days because you have privileged information, and this applies to everybody that sits in Congress, if she didn't follow the law, and it took her 365 days to report 
and she just did it because she got caught. Then what does that tell you? That she would, why didn't she? Well, I'm gonna tell you the excuses that she presented and you are a witness to this. Number one is that her attorney was a new into this. He didn't know the law. Then second, that there was a misunderstanding. Third is that, oh, her broker got the virus and he just couldn't file. These were, and you've reported on this. So you can, you can, if, it's, if you don't, if you don't want to see it, and when you tell me, and I think that you just told me something that is absolutely correct. The news media, local news media in Miami did not report what she did, that she broke the law. Well, we, yeah. Of course we did. Yeah, we know just we did. You, just you, but no one else did. That's, uh, that's, first off, that's not accurate. And that either. is the reason why I'm here, because you, even though I know that you are not a Republican and you do not necessarily like my position. And I'm not a Democrat and I have no position on your positions. But let me ask you this. Donald Trump recently, it was uncovered by the press here locally that Donald Trump sought trademarks in Cuba in 2008 for hotels, casinos, golf courses. He held on to those trademarks well into his presidency. Does that concern you? What I, what, um, I, I pay attention to what the president has done recently is not, it's not what he says, but what he does. And he has revived something called the Helms-Burton law, which was asleep for 30 years and where Democrats and Republican presidents didn't dare to establish Title III and Title IV. Trump did that. And he just announced that he was going to, um, cut the oxygen to, or, or, or uh, monies, or he was not going to allow the American companies to trade or to stay or to give money to uh, the repressive regime. So, so do you have I a think. reaction though to the action he took to seek trademarks in Cuba in 2008? Are you okay with the fact that he did that? I am not saying, I'm, I'm not privy of that information. All I'm thinking right now is as a president, what he did, what he has done when it comes to Cuba is exactly what my community wants to see. Because we are Cuban American, first generation Cuban American, but my parents and the Cuban people that live in South Florida, many whom I represent, really want to see a free Cuba once and for all. It's been 60 well, let's, years. Let's, let's talk about one of the things he did as president. One of his actions he took on immigration was separation of families. Did you agree with the president's policies of separating children from their families who are trying to cross the border? Listen, one of the things, and I'm very happy that you're asking me, because one of the things that I would like to do as a congresswoman is to, is to close down all those processing centers or detention centers where kids less than 16 years old are being held since the Obama uh, presidency. So I think that one of the things we should do, and I think we should concentrate on, is just to release, and we're talking about 75,000 children that are waiting to obtain political asylum or to be re, uh, reuni reunited with their families. All of them should be in foster care. I don't do you understand? You, 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 you reach back to Obama, so I just want to be clear. Do you understand the difference between the Obama policy and the Trump policy? Oh, I understand very well. And everything started with Obama. Wait, 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 and to put those kids in those detention centers. Wait, wait a second, wait a second. Uh, you know, because again, facts are important. The Inspector General for HHS issued a report looking at the Obama administration versus the Trump administration. And the Obama administration, their examples of family separation were rare and only in cases in which the parent or guardian was found to endanger the health of the child. The Trump administration made it a much more serious and systematic fashion in which they criminally charged the parent to justify taking the child away, which was not being done under the Obama administration. So they are radically different policies. I'm asking you, do you support and believe that the Trump policy has been a good one? 
I believe that everything started during the Obama years. This immigration topic is not easy. Obama started the cold rooms. You never heard about that? I'm not telling you that I agree with the fact that you're gonna separate your kids from your parents. That's why I believe that you have to talk about DACA and DAPA. And you have to talk about the hundreds of millions of uh, thousands of people that have been in this country for more than 15 years and they are not DACA or DAPA and they, you need to give them some type of legality because it's not true that you're going to deport them after they have been here for more than 15 years. They have paid their taxes, they have American children and they do not have a criminal record. So immigration is a very difficult topic. And I feel very confident that I could be within the GOP, a very big voice for immigration because I am a Hispanic. I am the member of the largest minority in the country. And I do believe that out of those 11 million people that you have here that do not have papers, 7.7 .7 million people that have been here for more than 20 years, have American kids, do, have not committed a crime, and they need to stay here with some type of legality. You, you talk about being an Hispanic, and in some of the independent expenditures that have been on Facebook advertising along that line, I've seen things that say, that if Donna, in, written in Spanish, if Donna Shalala can't read this, she shouldn't be representing us. Do you believe that, that it's disqualifying for Donna Shalala, the fact that she is not Hispanic, the fact that she doesn't speak Spanish? Do you, do you believe that that's an issue in this race? I think that Donna Shalala, regardless of whether she speaks Spanish or not, is that what disqualifies her are her own actions. Shalala has, is part of the Washington corrupt elite that has profited for years, for more than 30 years, and has amassed power and money. It's her actions, not whether she's Hispanic or whether she can speak the language or not. It's who she is. She has enriched herself by being a public servant. And that is why I believe that in 27, we don't need. From both parties, people want public servants that go to work for them, not for themselves. It has nothing to do with the language. It has to do with the values, has to do with the person and with the desire, the stamina. Another example, during the coronavirus, I was out there giving food out and social media shows it to you. You can go back to my Facebook, March, April, May, exposing myself, giving food to the seniors, to people that didn't have money to go to the supermarket. I was out there because if I want to serve them in Washington, I got to start serving them in Miami. My opponent was hiding in her house. So if you want the job, if you want the title, you need to do the job. Last thing I want to get into, because I know you, it's been an important area and then we'll, we'll wrap up, is this idea of, of socialism. You know, you've, you've talked about that as being, being a predominant issue as well in the campaign and other interviews I've heard you discuss. Do you believe Donna Shalala is a socialist? Oh, uh, she is, Donna Shalala, it is what she needs to be at the time. And I think that's a fantastic question. I'm going to answer with a fact. February 29th of this year, Mario diaz Ballard, Congresswoman from District Number 25, presented a resolution in Congress where people needed to vote in favor of socialism or against socialism. Donna Shalala walked away five minutes before the, the voting and she came back five minutes after. Why? Because she was hedging her bets. Because at that hour, no one really knew if Bernie Sanders was going to be the presidential nominee or Joe Biden. So she could not vote against socialism. And that is very telling because your record speaks for you. So right there, that's the answer. What is she? Whatever it's convenient at the time. So let me ask you this. You've also spoken a lot about how socialism or socialists have taken over the university system. Um, do you believe that, that universities are, ta are truly taken over by socialists, universities including FIU, which I think you've spoken about, then that they are indoctrinating our children in, in socialism? I think the whole academia world has been infiltrated by teachers. I cannot tell you specifically how many teachers in what university, but, but, but speaking from the point of view of academia and media, both have been infiltrated, if that's not the right verb, they have been influenced by people with very radical ideas that are not the American way of life. 
We are not a socialist nation. This democratic socialism, we really do not know what it is because not even Bernie Sanders has been able to determine the difference between socialism and democratic socialism. Well, give, me, give me a specific example. What, what issue, what policy, what, what, when you talk about throwing out the word socialism creates, creates a, a trigger word here in South Florida, but specifically, what are you referring to? Like, what issue, what, what policy, what action is being taken that you consider offensive? Right now, I, what, perfect, perfect, good question. Perfect example is what I just explained to you about Donna Shalila. No, no, I'm talking about a, I'm talking about a specific policy in government. Like, what is it that you oppose? Social Security, when it was enacted, it was considered socialist. Medicare, when it was enacted, it was considered socialist. So can you give me some specific examples of socialist policies, socialist proposals that are being planned that you're afraid of? But I, and I will, I will do that, but let me go to the people first because the people are the ones that bring in the ideas. We have, and here, this is facts, you have a Democratic Party that, been has, that has been infiltrated by that dogma. Then in that party, you have people that do not dare to denounce or to speak against that dogma. Case in point, my opponent, Donna Shalala. Right, you, you've covered that, but tell me what that dogma is. Tell me what specific proposals you're afraid are going to take root here in the United States. Well, the more that we're going to be slaves of government. When you give your health care to government, you reduce the person and you, and you make the government bigger. When you're telling me about the Green New Deal, but really in reality, we do not know specifically what that is. But it's the spirit. Don't you see that is the spirit? Is the intention. When they, they talk about democratic socialism, in reality, they really do not know what it is. But we do know. And history proves, Jim, that every time, either in a party or in an organization, the radical left grows up or rises up with so much energy, so much vigor, as we're seeing it in this country within the Democratic Party, it always tramples over, it crushes the more moderate positions. And that is why we have to be very afraid of, because they tell me, no, this is, it's Switzerland, it's Sweden, it's Norway. We're not talking about Cuba or Venezuela. You know, we heard that, Jim, 20 years ago when we were on the air, you and I, and we told, I mean, my, my Cuban dom compatriots would say to the Venezuelans, you've got to be very careful because this sounds like this democratic socialism that Hugo Chavez is presenting or is selling to the Venezuelan people sounds like communism. And they would say, no, you Cubans, you are very exaggerated. Right now, the average Venezuelan weighs 15 pounds less because of lack of food. So Freedom but, is one generation but, away. Earlier in the conversation, we talked about health care. You now say you want to build on Obamacare, that you do not want people to lose their Obamacare. That is government influence in health care in the same way that there is government influence in health care in the VA, Medicare for your mother. You know, so again, I guess I'm trying to understand what is it that you're concerned about? You are editing what I just said at the beginning. I'm telling you that right now, millions of people have Obamacare. You cannot take that away from them because then you will leave them with no choice. But I said immediately right after that we need to introduce more competition in this whole wide healthcare industry in this country that is highly deregulated and is highly subsidized. And I gave you the example of eye laser. Right. No, no. I, I get. No, I get the eye lasik. No, but it's, like it's two things combined because you cannot leave people stranded. But 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 wait a second. You support you support you support having, you know, pre-existing conditions. That's government telling private companies that they have to do this. You support insurance covering children up until they're 26 on their parents policies. Do you support, for instance, the government telling insurance companies that they cannot cancel your policy because you get sick? Do you support the government telling insurance companies that they cannot set caps on how much money that they're willing to pay if somebody gets sick either over the course of a year or a lifetime? Is that not government intruding on the private sector that, and so I'm trying to understand where you draw that line then.
What I'm saying to you is that I do not like government to get in the lives of the private individuals. That's what I'm telling you. Right now, we have a very major mess in this whole healthcare industry we have. So that's why we need to find ways to bring in more competition in order to change those, those, that list or those different aspects that you just mentioned. That's what I'm trying to say to you. All right. I, I, we're way over time. Last thing I'm just going to ask, just a simple question. On Saturday, you were at a Students for Trump rally. They were all chanting for more years. You've expressed your support for Donald Trump. A two-part question. One, you know, the district you're running in voted overwhelmingly by 18 or 20 points for Hillary Clinton. Are you not out of step then with your district supporting Donald Trump? And can you identify specific areas where you disagree, where you think the president has been wrong in what he's done? Listen, I'd like that you left the best question for last. Trump is very unconventional. Trump sometimes uses words that I would not use, but he has implemented policies that have been very good for my community and for South Florida, specifically the economic. We had the eco economics or the economy, the way it was in January and February of this year, where more Hispanics were working. You've heard it before, where minorities were working. I like what he's done with Cuba, what he did with Venezuela, what he's done with Israel, what he did with China, what he's done. So, so some of his policies have been very good for my community. And he is not a socialist. And I sign or I align myself with freedom. That is my answer to you. And one thing that you're asking me that I do not agree with him, immigration. I believe that I just told you that we have 11 million brothers and sisters in this country that do not have paper. And 7.7 .7 million of them have been here for more than 15 years. They have American kids. They, have, they don't have a criminal record. And they have worked and paid taxes. Those people need to stay with some type of legality, because otherwise we would not be the nation that we are, the beacon of, of human rights in the whole world.